Samuel Beckett wrote in, uh, in the novel uh, Murphy and the famous line uh, when that the sun shone having no alternative on the nothing new. He clearly didn't have the European Union uh, in, in mind uh, because uh, in the European Union the sun shines when it shines and it shines more often than, than one presumes uh, on something new almost every day. And we have certainly had uh, a huge number of challenges to address uh, in, the, in the past uh, couple of years as, especially. Uh, however, today I would like to place uh, events in Europe uh, in the context uh, of a broader uh, recalibration of our uh, political and economic uh, systems uh, around the world, in fact, uh, which is only magnified by the EU-specific features of our governance uh, framework. I would also like to look at some of the key uh, global trends um, and uh, understand how they affect the, the chances for Europe's uh, reincarnation. And finally, I will argue that uh, trends may be trends, but uh, we can still shape uh, the outcomes with a fair degree of success. And uh, for that, we need uh, foresight and, and anticipation. So let me start with the, uh, with the economy first. Um, I think when it comes to, to the economy, the key question to understand is whether um, the exceptional human progress which we have seen in the past uh, two centuries will continue or not. Uh, one of my favorite graphs shows uh, the rise of, shows the national income over the past uh, millennium. And, and that curve is flat um, all the time until the Industrial Revolution when it starts uh, to go pretty steeply um, upwards. Now the question to which we, we need to find an answer is uh, whether that steep rise will continue or, or not. Uh, because uh, there are many, obviously, who argue that we are uh, now entering a period in which uh, low growth will be the new normal in advanced uh, economies. And, in, and if that is the case, if this exceptionalism of the past uh, two decades is indeed um, over, then we would need to um, understand whether uh, we will be content with simply preserving uh, humanity's achievements uh, to date, uh, or would uh, angst and, and dissatisfaction um, prevail. I mean, are we genetically modified already to continue to strive for, for progress, or can we be happy enough with uh, the fruits of what has been, uh, what has been um, achieved? Reassuringly, uh, even though there are, there are lots of uh, proponents of the secular stagnation uh, hypothesis, hypothesis, I think there are ample reasons to, to believe that everything is in, our, uh, is in our hands. And of course, uh, productivity is key to um, um, uh, output potential, and productivity is not uh, only force of nature. It is something that we can, that we can shape. Uh, given, for example, that productivity and, and investment are uh, correlated, we can stimulate productivity uh, growth if we increase investment. And this is exactly what we are now trying to do in the European Union with uh, the investment plan, um, the European Fund for Strategic Investments, which uh, is a success story of the, past, uh, of the past year. We have been able to mobilize about 100 billion euro in investment um, using uh, EU budget um, uh, guarantee. There are projects which are starting in uh, almost all member states. In 26 member states, there are now projects financed from the, the FC, uh, from the FC uh, fund. Uh, similarly, uh, the digital um, is uh, key to productivity. I mean, if there is one reason that explains why the United States uh, is ahead of us in productivity growth. It is uh, the adoption of uh, digital means, the way that uh, American companies have been, have been able to make uh, digital revolution part and parcel of what, of what they uh, uh, do. Uh, but there is something else, I think, going on in the economic exchange, um, and, and it makes uh, our economies more interactive uh, and, uh, yeah, and, and, and more uh, connected. And the rise of uh, platforms uh, and collaborative economy are perhaps the best uh, um, expressions of this uh, phenomenon, but it takes place also in, in the more conventional areas. 
We have uh, integration of product and service uh, markets taking place on an unprecedented scale to the extent that the two have become indistinguishable. We cannot speak any longer of product and service markets as two separate um, uh, branches of the, of the economy. They are connected. When we look at the map of European growth from the micro perspective, what we see interestingly is, there are, is, is that there are patches of highly performing, highly productive firms surrounded by um, a sea of underperforming um, firms uh, which have not managed to uh, raise the productivity. So we need to uh, take that into account when uh, you know, deciding on the allocation of resources because we need to enable those highly performing uh, firms to, to grow, but we also need to support the, those underperforming uh, so that they uh, rise uh, their productivity uh, levels. And then there are issues of, of how we, we measure uh, prosperity, uh, which are uh, extremely uh, important. And, uh, and our, our ways of measurement have been unfairly uh, static. Um, although high-level commissions have dealt with the issue of moving beyond uh, the GDP, there is little indication that it is around the corner. Um, as The Economist put it in, uh, in an April issue, which would you prefer to be, a medieval monarch or a modern office worker? The king had everything, uh, had the finest silks, had the finest foods. Um, he had armies of servants, but uh, he was still a martyr to toothache. He was prone to fatal infections. It took him a week by courage to travel between palaces, and he was tired listening to the same gestures. So the economist concluded that life as a 21st century dro office drone looks more appealing once you think about uh, modern uh, dentistry, antibiotics, air travel, uh, smartphones, and, and YouTube. So in other words, we need to be able to express uh, what we mean by prosperity uh, in, in an altogether different uh, fashion. Now, the recalibration of the economy is closely related to uh, a fundamental shift in the way that politics is, uh, is exercised, uh, including in the oldest uh, democracies. Uh, we had been warned of um, the advances <coughs> of populism um, before, but it is really now that it has arrived uh, at our uh, doorstep. It is partly a delayed reaction to the economic crisis and partly a function of uh, technological and societal change, which, among other things, lowers the barriers of entry to political activity. You can set up yourself in politics uh, much more easily than at any time uh, in, in the past. It also makes our, our public life ultra-transparent. We know pretty much everything about everyone who is involved in, in, in politics. Now, in the 1981 classic uh, American politics promise of disharmony, Samuel um, Huntington predicted that around this time we would be entering a period uh, that he called, uh, um, he called creedal passion, his own term for moralizing distrust of organized power. And as Huntington explained, uh, in, in, the, in terms of American beliefs, government is supposed to be a egalitarian, B participatory, C open, D non coercive, and E responsive to the demands of individuals and groups. The problem is that you cannot, uh, that no government can deliver all these things and remain a government. Um, so the tension between power and, and le legitimacy is really uh, of fundamental importance uh, to our uh, democratic debate at the moment. And it is accentuated by, by this age of scarcity in which we find ourselves in, in the low growth um, and environment. And when we look at European issues from uh, authorization of glyphosate, which is what the, the College of Commissioners has dealt with now for several times, uh, on to TTIP, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really another expression of that same uh, tension between power and, 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 and legitimacy. Uh, and it will need to be resolved and, and addressed. I think this issue in particular will not go away by itself. So populism exists where, where voters are uh, misled to um, believe that the world is a simpler place than it actually is. 
Uh, of course, complexity is on the rise. Huh? Uh, if you read European Council conclusions or European Commission communications, the language has, has gotten much simpler. But these are still pretty complicated things, and, uh, and not everyone will, uh, will understand what is, what is at stake. Populism is, is, in that context, about suggesting that there are shortcuts to prosperity and security where such shortcuts do not exist. Um, as Andrew Keane has written, in the age of misinformation, it is more difficult than ever for voters to know what is true and what is uh, not true. Uh, however, populism, I believe, should also be understood as a signaling uh, mechanism. It tells us that something is not right, that problem uh, exists, which we might have overlooked. Um, by and large, voters have this incredible instinct of uh, knowing what is right for the nation or society, perhaps not always in the short term, but, uh, uh, but more so in the medium to, to long term. But I think that instinct uh, exists. Uh, so... Populism should be read as, uh, uh, as, as much a problem for, for the mainstream as for anybody else. Um, and it is, it, is, uh, it is not incurable. I mean, there are studies that have been done recently about uh, the angst that American voters uh, feel in the context of the current election campaign. And the conclusion that has been reached is that it's, it's mostly about politics, not about economics. We, we presume that it is about economics. It's about difficulties of, of the middle class. Uh, but people say it's, it's mostly political. Um, an Associated Press poll has showed that Americans feel pretty fine about their financial stability, but at the same time they are intensely angry about the functioning of the government. So the answer, I believe, must lie in greater inclusion. Um, there must also be more civic and political education. Research shows that many people don't understand the concept of the interest rate yeah, in, advanced, uh, in advanced economies. And if you don't understand the concept of the interest rate, which is not the most sophisticated of all economic concepts, I mean, how, how <laughs> will you understand what quantitative easing uh, amounts to? So I think a massive effort needs to be uh, undertaken to create a more fertile ground for evidence-based policy, because... Uh, Evidence-based policy is the only response to, uh, to populism that, uh, that we can think of. Uh, but we need to prepare uh, ourselves uh, for, for it uh, much, uh, much better. Now, the political uh, and economic reorientation in Europe is taking place in the context of broader um, trends to which all, Europe also needs to um, respond. And this is a combination of headwinds and, and, and tail, tailwinds um, at, the same, at the same time. Uh, let me speak about three of them. Uh, I think from the global perspective, the most uh, uh, important one has to do with the finality of our uh, resources. Um, researchers argue that uh, we are entering uh, the Anthropocene, a new epoch, when the human footprint would have a significant impact uh, on the planet's geology. Uh, if uh, um, our traces are to be discovered uh, by the future generations, by the archaeologists uh, of whatever, 30th century, then our age will be the age of concrete. We are already using 1.6 resources of the planet, and we are heading towards using two planets by the year 2030. Just imagine the impact that the additional 2.5 uh, billion people that we are expecting by 2050 will have on our resources, especially that all of them will share our aspirations, which is a new phenomenon. 20 years ago, people in many developing countries were broadly happy with what they had. But then the smartphone arrived, and immediately they were able to connect and see what life could be like. In, uh, in the more developed, in more advanced countries. And this start, started this uh, incredible rise of, of human aspiration that we witness uh, today. So I think, I think these demands of sustainability will be, will be really uh, key for us in the future. And in Europe, we have managed to decouple uh, carbon emissions and growth, which is a huge achievement. Uh, we are not trying to sell it to the rest of the world, but we have not decoupled growth and materials. We have not decoupled growth and, and resources. So that's the agenda for the future, to, to link 
circular economy models with uh, our low carbon uh, ambitions. Uh, what it means in practical terms is extending the life of mobile phones uh, from average two years to, let's say, five years. I think we, we could survive with that. Uh, it could also mean car sharing. Yeah? One car that is shared can replace five to 20 cars, depending on the exact model, uh, with enormous implications in terms of uh, um, emission savings. Milton Friedman once said that what is unsustainable will not be sustained. And I think there's a lot of truth in that, in that rather uh, simple statement. Another key trend has to do with demography. Um, in the EU, it is the question of uh, rising life expectancy and declining fertility, which is obviously a challenge for our pension and, and health uh, systems. We have at the Commission uh, our flagship aging report, and that um, aging report says that uh, by 2030 we will have uh, two people of work, working age supporting, uh, supporting each person um, over 65, um, as opposed to four at the moment uh, in 2016. So just imagine what, what this is going to, to mean to uh, our pension systems. And many member states are actually undoing the reforms to the pension systems that they had undertaken during, during the crisis. The rise of the global middle class has been described in many foresight uh, reports, including the flagship U.S. National Intelligence Council Global Trends 2030 report, as one of the, the key trends for, for the century. Well, I think that trend remains valid in the, sense of, uh, in the sense that aspirations that have been invoked are here to stay. And I spoke about one dimension of it. Uh, but let me say a few words about another. In a recent poll uh, for the BBC World Service, uh, it turned out that uh, a sense of global citizenship is strongest in the emerging countries. In Nigeria, 73% of uh, the local population believes that they are primarily global citizens and, and only in the second order priority Nigerians. It's now the other way around in the advanced countries, especially Germany, that there is less sense of global citizenship, and, and this sense is, uh, is invoked with a, with a vengeance in, in the developing, in the emerging countries. However, the future of, uh, of this great global convergence is very uncertain. Uh, the catching up process has stopped in the course of this recent crisis. Um, although some countries uh, have, have done better than others, India's demand for oil has just overtaken China's demand for oil, so you can see that there are, there, are, there, there are shifting grounds in terms of who is doing better and who is doing worse. But the World Bank has just calculated that uh, it is uh, now only 47% of uh, the developing countries that are catching up with the United States, and it was 83% in 2007. So the catching up process has, uh, has slowed down. However, the trend of trends, for me, is the pervasive influence of technological uh, change on our societies. And there is a fascinating debate among experts as to whether innovation, whether we have seen the best of uh, innovation or if the best is still uh, to come. Uh, I think that when we see medical teams uh, helping paraly paralyzed uh, people walk, or if we see teams of engineers in, in Europe uh, trying to put together a flying car, as some are doing, uh, which is what Henry Ford uh, dream, dreamt about say, in, the 19, uh, in the 1930s, we would be forgiven for thinking that there is uh, no end to uh, innovation. Even space technology is now, is now more and more accessible, with New Zealand being one of uh, um, the world leaders for rocket uh, launchers. So what is, what is, I think, important is that innovation affects pretty profoundly uh, the way we function and the way we relate to e each other. And in Europe in particular, we should not become dormant uh, to uh, this debate about the end of innovation, because innovation is remaking uh, industries. Uh, the Americans uh, are now firmly pushing into Industry 4.0, uh, and Europe has to be ready for it uh, as, as well. We have to be much more geared uh, towards experimentation and an entrepreneurial uh, culture of uh, risk-taking. Um, as Wayne Gretzky, a Canadian hockey player, once uh, put it, uh, a good player goes where the puck is. 
a great player goes where the pack will be. And I think we will need to understand where the pack will be and we'll need to go in that, uh, in that direction. Um, New technologies and digitalization are finally changing profoundly um, the nature of work and um, the types of jobs that will be needed uh, are, are affected uh, and by whom they will be done. Uh, Walmart is now in the process of developing a drone system that will replace jobs of inventory quality assurance employees. So these types of developments obviously f uh, fuel fears of, of automation. And, uh, and there is a reason for it. Uh, OECD has estimated that 9% of jobs in the advanced economies are uh, at, at, at a high risk of being automated, while out of 25% uh, other jobs, half of the tasks will change due to uh, automation. So that, this, is a, this is a profound uh, change which we are uh, witnessing. And of course, it's a mixed, uh, it's a mixed blessing because there will be new opportunities, and, uh, but there will also be uh, challenges to which we, we will need to um, adjust. Um, one of the implications is that we will have more diverse uh, working histories. Um, in the United States, the average uh, um, worker stays on the job for 4.4 years. But among the millennials, 91% um, of them expect to stay in the job for less than three years uh, for three years' time. So if they continue with this trend, they will have 15 to 20 jobs in their, in their lifetime. And what, uh, what this means is that we need to rethink our welfare uh, policies um, and uh, along a lifelong approach. What it means is that we need to customize welfare policies so as to make it better suited for the needs of individual uh, worker that will need to have different skill sets during a lifetime and that will also need to carry uh, their welfare benefits uh, with them as they go along. Now, facing these uh, tectonic shifts, uh, Europe has, in my view, two main tasks. One is to build uh, resilience and the other one is to renew the uh, social contract among uh, our citizens. Uh, resilience is the term that comes from, from physics. Uh, it's about a body being hit, uh, it's about absorbing the shock, it's, and it's about releasing the energy. So basically it's about how we prepare uh, for um, uh, shocks, for crises, which are our new normal. Uh, how we handle them, and then how we recover uh, from them. And I think much of what we do in the European Union at present is about uh, uh, resilience. First of all, the economic and social associated with completion of uh, the economic and monetary union, primarily through the banking union. Secondly, recasting our migration and, and asylum uh, policy. Uh, and then the security agenda uh, with uh, last year's proposals and, and this year's proposal for the security union. And finally, uh, this will all lead to a new global strategy, um, which will be proposed uh, at the end of the month. So the euro and the migration crises are, to my mind, uh, um, twin challenges which will shape Europe's identity in, uh, in future years. And there are strong parallels in, in the way in which they were addressed, uh, in a sense that in both uh, cases we had an external shock, in both cases, we were unprepared uh, for what was to, uh, to come. And in both cases, the whatever-it-takes moment arrived. Uh, in the case of the, the euro crisis, this was Mario Draghi's statement that built on agreements uh, concerning the banking union. And in the migration crisis, this was the EU-Turkey uh, deal from the spring of this year, plus the, the entire package which uh, came, which came um, with it. However, of course, resilience in itself will not, will not suffice if we, um, if we don't have a broader uh, sense of uh, renewal in, in Europe. Um, and the latter, I think, is, is entirely, um, is entirely associate, associated with the way that citizens embrace sustainability and uh, technological uh, change. And the guidance for all that uh, lies in foresight. I think we live in an in, in age of... Uh, foresight where those who are better prepared uh, for the future will, uh, will, 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 will win. 
Um, but foresight by, by itself is not enough. We need to imagine how foresight can become part of uh, a, transformative, uh, a transformative project that can win uh, traction with our citizens. As Eisenhower said, plans are not uh, enough, but uh, planning is, in, uh, as Eisenhower said, plans are useful, but planning is uh, indispensable. So that points to the importance of, uh, of process as well. We need to make uh, foresight part of our uh, public uh, uh, debate. Um, and much of uh, our preparedness is about learning the lessons of the previous crisis. Um, I think uh, we have learned uh, to a sufficient degree the lessons of the Great Depression. The US in particular had a pretty comprehensive response uh, to this crisis building on the experience uh, from the 1930s. Um, our, responsive, our response was less comprehensive, but, um, but what we see now is, uh, is a convergence of outcomes. As Jason Furman, President Obama's, uh, President Obama's economic advisor, uh, puts it, what, uh, what unifies us today is the commonality of challenges across the Atlantic. We might have had different reactions to the crisis, the, the Americans might have emerged uh, quicker from the recession, but we are now pretty much in the same situation because we face the same, the same challenges. And he mentions productivity, uh, growth, inequality, uh, labor market participation as the ones uh, that trouble him um, most. Now, to end uh, on, on, a, on a broader note, I think that what, um, uh, what is an essential part of foresight is how our vision uh, resonates with that of uh, others in, uh, in, in the world. And I think our generation is, is uniquely aware of uh, uh, the fragility which global uh, interdependence uh, brings. Uh, some of the threats will be systemic and, and existential. Um, Martin Rees wrote, uh, the astronomer royal in uh, the United Kingdom, wrote a few years ago a book, The Last Century, in which uh, he argued that we have a 50% chance of surviving the 21st century, given the number of existential risks uh, ahead. And we can name uh, a few of them from pandemics uh, through some cybercrime to proliferation uh, of weapons of mass destruction. Um, so that, that will need to be addressed. But I think equally, uh, the issue which, uh, which uh, we face during the crisis, but from which we are slowly uh, emerging is our loss of faith in the ability to uh, change uh, the world. I think this rise of the rest paradigm has been, has been readily and too easily accepted by, uh, by the West and has led to lack of willingness to engage uh, in, uh, beyond our, our borders. And this is now changing. I think the new global strategy, which uh, will come at the end of uh, the month, the EU global strategy, will, will reinstate our uh, commitment to the European values, but also to our interests. And the word partnership uh, will, will reappear in the documents uh, a, number of, uh, of a number of times. But I think the, the real uh, reason why uh, we will, our arguments will resonate with the rest of uh, the world has to do with the quality of our governance uh, and the quality and the attractiveness of our uh, democracies. And this is where we need to fight the post-truth politics with uh, politics of, uh, of truth. As uh, George Burns, the actor, said, uh, look to the future because this is where you will spend the rest of your life. I think that's, uh, that sentence hasn't lost its, uh, its meaning, um, especially that we know much more about the future than, than the previous uh, generations, and we simply make, we need to make uh, good uh, advantage uh, of it. Thanks very much.